it's a curious thing, having completed kinematics and the laws of motion according to Newton, and made observations about two symmetries of the universe, the law of conservation of energy, and again, the law of conservation of momentum that we just finished discussing, that I would stop at this point and redo all of those concepts again, uh, and go on about it for, for some time. Everything that I'm about to do should be familiar to you, which is an advantage to you as a student, because perhaps we could use a little more time contemplating the fundamental principles of classical physics. The only difference here, we're going to study them in a different context, a context that we have hardly touched on so far, and that is rotational motion. In a sense, we touch on rotational motion because we talk about circular motion of an object, both uniform and non-uniform. We discover that the acceleration of such motion is v squared over r, and we find some applications of that. But those are really Newton's laws application. We can appreciate the fact that throughout our universe, in a mechanical sense, there are plenty of instances of rotation, and we have need to find utility in describing rotational mo motion in general. It's not just good for the physicist, but particularly the engineer, where many mechanical systems have rotating parts. In fact, some, some of the best 19th century technologies based on such things, um, rotational motion. But rotational motion is still motion. I'm still talking about objects that have mass moving with velocities, positions, and accelerations through space and time. So there's no reason for me to invent new physics, simply to take the physics that I already have and reapply it in a different context. And when we do that, we discover that there are some generalizing principles that evolve and that we can identify. And so that's what we're going to look, be looking for. What I'm going to do in today's lecture is to describe all of our kinematics laws that we've um, formulated to describe motion in one dimension and realizing that that motion is perfectly general to three dimensions, but are one-dimensional kinematics in a straight line, motion that is not rotational at all. I'm going to rediscover those laws in the context of rotational motion, an interesting feature that I want to mention just as an aside, because as an underlying theme of our physics, I keep mentioning this. When an object moves, it's translational motion, that is motion in a straight line, and it's rotational motion, which I'm about to describe directly. They are linearly independent one from the other. That is the motion of an object that might be rotating and translating simultaneously. Imagine that I have a rod here on the floor and I kick it and it moves across the floor both spinning and translating simultaneously. Those two motions are linearly independent one from the other. That is, I could examine the center of mass of the object as it spins along, just as in an earlier lecture on center of mass, I threw a hammer across the room and said that I could view its projectile, the projectile motion of its center of mass. I could examine the center of mass of the rotating system as it propagates along and treat it like translational motion, kinematics in one dimension, and ignore the rotational motion, because the rotational motion is independent. And then if someone asked me a question about the rotational motion, I could then apply the new laws that we're about to formulate, well, not new laws we're about to formulate, but new techniques that we're about to formulate, to the rotational motion independently of the translational motion. So what you'll see me doing here for quite a bit is simply examining rotational motion of objects and ignoring their translational motion, but near the end it'll become really special and we'll take those two motions and combine them into rather sophisticated problems that are fun to solve. For example, you can look forward to imagine a situation where an object is um, rolling but before it begins to roll quite well, it skids. An example would be a bowling ball. I swing a bowling ball, and when the bowling ball hits the, la the lane, it is not rotating at all. But because of frictional interaction between the bowling ball and the floor, it begins to rotate. It skids for a time. As the action of the friction force increases the rotational motion, reducing the translational motion, it's quite a sophisticated problem to solve. And ultimately, that's where we're headed with this. Um, so we'll get some new physics about it, the ability to solve new problems that we couldn't solve before. But it's always excellent. But we begin, to begin today with something quite simple and something very familiar. Imagine that I have an object that goes around in uniform circular motion. As I said, circular motion is a kind of rotational motion. And so here it is, an object of mass m is going around in circular motion. And so it has a velocity v. So I draw a tangent to the motion here. Uh, and I suppose it has a mass m. So you might think, well, this is very much like a, like a uh, uh, circular motion lecture, because what I'm going to suggest is that as time goes on, the position of the object will change here. It will translate, well, not translate, it will travel along the arc and arrive here with a velocity that's once again tangent 
to the radius of this circular motion. And in doing so, it will subtend an angle theta. Going from the initial position to the final position, it takes a certain amount of time to do that. And when I was formulating the centripetal acceleration v squared over r, if you go back and look at some notes on that or re-listen to the lecture, you'll find that I talked about how it might be easy to describe this, the relationship between the speed as it travels along the arc length. Because if I'm doing this at constant speed, then naturally the speed is the distance that I travel divided by the time, which is the arc length that I travel, divided by the time it takes to travel along that length of arc, a rather obvious statement. That I could instead describe the position, not in terms of the arc length s along the circle, but in terms of the angle theta subtended in terms of the angle theta subtended. So instead of describing in terms of position, I will describe in terms of angular position. For the purposes of today's lecture, I'm going to have to write some words. I'm never like a huge fan of writing words, but I have to give some definitions here. Theta is the angular position. Now the angular position is rather a curious quantity because an angular position is measured with no units at all. And you say, wait a second, should I leave the, the angle is measured in radians. That's the unit, radians. Radians are a non-unit. Radians are not a dimension. I write rad there as the radian dimension, or the radians say that the angle is measured in radians, the angular position measured in radians. So you know what I'm talking about. So you know that I'm not saying degrees. It's really important that we establish that. But I know that the angular position is not measured in any radian in, in any particular unit. Because I can write the arc length formula that S is equal to the radius. Here I've used capital R. Sometimes we use lowercase r. I'm just making this up. S is equal to R times theta. So the angular position is related to the arc position along the circular motion by the radius of the thing R. Well, if R is measured in meters and S is measured in meters, you see that theta can have no units at all. I've also said angular position, which makes a parallel to the translational position X that I would have done uh, in one-dimensional kinematics. So you might wonder, is angular position a vector quantity? The answer is no. We say, wait a second, Chadley, I've read the chapter. The textbook says that it is. That is inappropriate to refer to the angular position as a vector. Now, if you decide to say that angular position is a vector, you do get some useful mathematical quantities or mathematical relationships out of it, useful tools of working with angular, angular position. If you say that it's a vector, it is not a vector because it turns out that vector quantities are a little bit more sophisticated than just arrows. One property that vectors have to have is that vectors must uh, be, oh darn it, the names of properties. You can add them in any order. What is that? Associative? Commutative? No. <laughs> uh, is it commutative? Look up mathematics. Okay, well. A requirement is that you must be able to add them in any order. So here I have the angular uh, position. Let me define for you the angular displacement. The angular displacement is the change in the angular position. So it's going to be the final angular position minus the initial angular position. That's not a surprise. Is it a vector? I'll prove to you that it's not. Consider that I have this book here. And here it is. I'll show it to you so that you can see the cover right in this. Now, I'm going to subject this book to three angular displacements. We have to remember what they are. We have to remember what the angular displacements are, because I'm going to do it twice. So here, here they are. Around the x-axis, clockwise, pi on 2. Around the y-axis, clockwise, pi on 2. Around the z-axis, clockwise, pi on 2. So I've made it easy to remember. Always clockwise, always pi on 2. Okay. Now you have to remember your axes too. Here's my coordinate system as we discussed before. The x-axis points towards you. The y-axis points to the right. And the z-axis points upward. All right. So here I go doing these displacements to the book. Right? x-axis angular displacement. Not translating, but displacing through an angle. 90 degrees clockwise. Boom. Right? Now, I gotta look down the y-axis, 90 degrees clockwise. Boom. I gotta go around the z-axis, 90 degrees clockwise. Boom. And so now the book, which started out like this, has changed its orientation, so now it's like in reading position for me. I'm looking at the cover from above, the right way up. There you go. Three angular displacement. One, two, three. Now I'm going to do it again, starting from the same initial, but I'm going to do them in a different order. Because if angular displacement is a vector, it must have the property that it doesn't matter what order I do them in. It must have that property. It must. So let's check it out. Angular displacement, I'll do the y-axis, then the x-axis, then the z-axis. Around the y-axis, 90 degrees, clockwise. Well, pi on 2, sorry. Pi on 2, clockwise. There you go. 
around the x-axis, 90 degrees clockwise. I keep saying 90 degrees, pi on 2. Around the z-axis, 90 degrees. It's incredible. Around the z-axis, pi on 2, clockwise. I don't end up in the same place. I don't end up in the same place. When it comes to angular displacements, it matters what order you add them in. And therefore, I don't care who says so, angular displacement is not a vector. Now, you might fake it as a vector quantity at some point. But angular displacement is not a vector quantity. And a lot of students, when they hear that, they get happy. Because working with vector quantities is sometimes difficult. In fact, when we transition to doing conservation of energy, and energy is a scalar, we have a good time writing equations where we don't have to worry about the components of vector. And the same applies here. An angular displacement is not a vector quantity. An angular displacement is not a vector quantity. So here's angular displacement. So what I'm going to do with this angular displacement measured in radians is I'm going to derive some kinematic quantities from it. The important thing here is that for you to observe that there is a perfect analogy between our kinematic quantities in translational motion and our kinematic quantities in rotational motion. Is it S over R or what like, angle are you looking at? It would be, I didn't label it here, but here's the arc length S. So yes, S divided by R is the angle theta in radians. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I want to remind you of some quantities that we defined before, the displacement. Uh, X is the translational displacement. And from X, I define the velocity, which is equal to the derivative of X with respect to time. Notice I wrote X and not delta X for the displacement. I'm going to do the same thing. And then once I have defined the velocity, I also define the acceleration, which is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, the simple kinematic relationships which you've already taken advantage of to solve problems. We do the same thing again, except now, Consider the angular displacement theta, and I'm going to define a quantity that is the derivative of the angular displacement with respect to time. I can take the derivative with respect to time of any quantity that I want, and I appreciate that what this quantity would mean is the rate at which the angular displacement happens. The rate at which the angular displacement happens. Well, that needs a name. Its name is omega. Its name is omega. What's... Its symbol is omega. Its name is angular velocity. Its name is angular velocity. It is the rotational analog of velocity. Yeah, sometimes I will jokingly refer to it as chubby w. It's the Greek letter omega, lowercase. It is the lowercase Greek omega. It is a chubby w. Oh, it's like a horseshoe, right? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> angular velocity. Angular velocity, you know from time to time we have a little difficulty with nomenclature in physics. We give things different names or funny names or use funny symbols for it. You'll hear me refer to this by a different name because I've done some more advanced physics and whatnot and the more fancy your physics gets, you start to call this thing by a different name. You start to call it angular frequency. Angular frequency. So from time to time, I'll say angular frequency because it's my habit to do so, but of course I'm referring to the angular velocity. The units of the angular velocity are quite curious because they're radians per second. Just as when I take a derivative of the position with respect to time, I get units of meters per second. The angular velocity has units of radians per second, but radians are a non-unit. Radians are a non-unit, so you won't see me write radian. What I'll write is seconds to the minus one is the unit that I'll use for the angular velocity, seconds to the minus one. You can see now why that's related to a frequency, because seconds to the minus one is hertz, which is the unit for the linear frequency or the translational frequency. Word of caution there, it is not the linear frequency, it is the angular frequency. It's a simple relationship between the two. Omega is equal to two pi times the translational frequency or the linear frequency. Omega is equal to two pi f. That's an equation I'm going to use a lot later on in the course, but I just thought I'd mention it now for that relationship between angular frequency and linear frequency. Uh, and it turns out they're related in this particular physics as well. We'll see if we can find any use for that as we go along. So I've defined the angular velocity simply by taking the derivative of the angular displacement with respect to time. It's very familiar. But once I have this angular velocity, I'm probably going to ask a question. What if the angular velocity itself changes as a function of time? That is, what is the derivative of the angular velocity with respect to time? Well, it has a name, and that name is alpha, the Greek letter alpha. It is the angular acceleration. 
The angular acceleration naturally has units of radians per second squared. But again, saying that radian is a non-unit, I'm going to say per second squared. That's how you'll tip, <laughs> not per second, second, per second squared, like that. That's how you'll see me write the unit for that. The point is this. I make a big deal about a very small thing. The angular quantities are defined exactly the same way as the translational quantities, and they are simply related to each other. Because if S, the displacement along the arc there, is equal to R times theta, then V is equal to R times omega, then A is equal to R times alpha. The relationship between them is so simple, you might, the student at this point, wonder. How useful is this? If they're simply related by the constant value of R in circular motion, it turns out it's extraordinarily important and powerful. Very, very useful. Uh, this concept of angular quantities over translational quantities. You will find yourself very often calculating one to the other because they are in, pro in proportion according to the radius. Now, what would happen if I uh, asked the question, what is the motion like in the case when the angular acceleration is constant? Now, that's a special case of problems. I can invent problems where the angular acceleration is not constant, just like I can invent problems where the translational acceleration is not constant. But what happens in the case where the angular acceleration is not a constant? Well, consider, please. All right, I'm sorry. I'm doing the opposite. I'm considering what happens when the angular acceleration is a constant. So I'm saying that the angular acceleration is equal to a constant. And what are the consequences of that? Well, since the angular acceleration is equal to the derivative of the angular velocity with respect to time, then the differential of angular velocity is naturally alpha dt, which begs me to integrate both sides of the equation, the result of the integral being that the change in the angular velocity, delta omega, and I'm adapting to writing these symbols again after having done kinematics for, for so long here, that delta omega would be equal to the integral of the constant alpha dt, which is obviously just alpha uh, times t, and the consequence of that, realizing that delta omega is equal to the final omega minus the initial omega, is that omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha times t. So quite delightful. I discover that the kinematic equation for translational motion, v is equal to v naught plus at, has a rotational analog. Omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t. The kinematic equations that I love so dearly, at least in this case, have a rotational analog which is the same equation with the symbols swapped out, which means there's a whole class of problems that I can solve where I say a thing is rotating with constant angular acceleration. The initial angular speed is this, and a certain amount of time goes by. What's the final angular speed? I could calculate that. If I was teaching on a low level, I could even say, make a list of the known quantities and fill out the list and choose which kinematic equation to use. It's the same. It's the same kinematics. It's the same kinematics. And indeed, consider after I do this that omega the angular velocity is the derivative of the angular displacement with respect to time, or the derivative of the angular position with respect to time, I should say, such that the differential of angular position d theta is equal to omega dt, and I'll integrate that, but I won't integrate it until I've made the substitution omega naught plus uh, alpha times t. And then I get something spectacularly unsurprising for my effort, that the change in angular position, that is the angular displacement, delta theta, is equal to omega naught times t, plus one-half alpha t squared. Again, a very familiar equation. That theta is equal to theta naught plus omega naught times t plus one-half alpha times t squared. The rotational analog, the rotational analog, exactly the same physics again. And so all I have to do to be successful at solving problems is to transform my thinking to apply the same concepts that I'm already expert at solving into their rotational analog. Hopefully what this does is it makes you wonder, is there a rotational analog for force? Yes. Is there a rotational analog for energy? Yes. Is there a rotational analog for momentum? Yes. And that is what this entire unit of study is about, is finding the rotational analogs and applying them to the, co to, to the very, very classic problems associated with this. Uh, before I finish up, I mean, this is, the, this is the basics of it. It's quite simple and straightforward. It doesn't require a lot of mental horsepower on part of the student in order to understand. But before I finish this up, I want to do an example. The example is in no way like essential that you memorize, but I'd like to do an example uh, just to put this into some context that may be familiar to you. Consider that I have a pulley wheel. I'll draw here a pulley is quite large like that. 
And then I wish I had drawn a better circle, but can't have everything. There's a pulley wheel, and it has some radius. Uh, and I'm going to call the radius of this pulley wheel R1, because uh, it suits me. And it happens that it rotates. Uh, the direction of the rotation is sort of arbitrary. Is it rotates with an angular velocity that I'm going to call omega1. It rotates like that. And next door to it, in the same plane, I'm going to put a smaller pulley. Uh, significantly smaller. So it's not difficult to draw. And it has a different radius, obviously. I'm going to call that radius R2. And I'm going to say that it rotates in the same direction with an angular velocity omega 2. I can't squeeze an arrow in there, so you'll appreciate, well, you'll immediately appreciate that they move uh, in the same direction. Because what I'm going to do is something that you've seen before on your bicycle or on a power tool or some other machine that you've observed in your lifetime. I'm going to connect them with a chain. Oh, geez, the line is terrible. I'm going to connect them with a chain, and the chain need not be taut down here. It kind of hangs like that. Such that the smaller wheel is driving the larger wheel. There's probably some, if it's, a, if it's a rubber belt, there's some sort of friction. Or if it's chain, there are some spokes on, whatever. So that some force can be applied, which I have not considered in this discussion so far. I'm just considering uh, the motion of the thing. And it turns in such a way that the belt moves with a speed v. I could certainly find some way to measure experimentally and say this is the rate at which the belt moves. Well, that belt velocity is the velocity that the belt comes off the wheel of radius r1. And it's the rate at which the velocity or the rate at which the belt goes onto the wheel of radius r2. That is a thing that r1 and r2 have in common, or that wheel 1 and wheel 2 have in common is the tangential velocity of the edge of the wheel. The tangential velocity, that velocity, you know, going back to this original diagram, this velocity here that's tangent to the circular motion. That tangential velocity is the same for both. That is, V1 is equal to V2, if I can write it that way. V1 is equal to V2, it's in principle equal to V. They have the same tangential velocity, but now in the context of angular quantities, in the context of angular quantities, I know that that velocity v1, for example, must be equal to r1 omega 1. v1 is equal to r1 omega 1. And v2 is equal to r2 omega 2. Now, just for instructional purposes, I want to get the radii on one side and the angular velocities on the other side, so I'll divide. Such that omega 1 divided by omega 2 is equal to r2 divided by r1. The ratios of the angular speed of these two disks, which is related to the frequency of rotation of these two disks by a factor of 2 pi, is equal to the ratio of their radii. This has a colloquial name that you've heard of before. This is a gear ratio. It's a gear ratio. Gears are how I change the velocity of rotation in machines, right? It's how I change the velocity of rotation uh, on my bike because I pedal the front crank of my bike, which is quite large, right? Everybody's seen a bicycle. We know that the crank on the front of uh, what's attached to the pedals is like a disc with spokes on it, right? And then at the back, smaller, a smaller disc so that the radii are different. That causes the angular frequencies to be different, and that's important. And that's important because the wheel turns much faster than I pedal when I'm riding my bike. The wheel turns much faster than I, uh, I, I pedal. If I was limited, like if the, the uh, sprocket on my bike was the same as the, wheel, uh, the sprocket on the back, they had the same radius, my bike wheel would only turn as fast as I can pedal, and I would go quite slowly indeed. And of course, it turns out on my bike that I adjust for the gear ratio by, and there are some controls there that push the chain off onto smaller and smaller and smaller gears, and it changes those ratios. Changing the ratios changes the amount of force that I exert to make the bike do what I want it to do, and that's true. But leaving the force out of it, it changes the rate at which the wheel rotates for every crank that I do, right? So it changes the, my velocity. So when I'm shifting gears, because um, I, I think I, I've mentioned quite, uh, I cycle quite a bit. When you cycle for great distances, your, 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 your training for that is to cycle with the same cadence, same frequency. This is my frequency. This is how I pedal. And if going up a hill or hitting a headwind or going down a hill causes me to change my cadence, 
I switch my gears so that the frequency remains the same. And that's how you cycle effectively over long distances. You just keep the frequency the same. And I keep the frequency the same by changing the gear ratio whenever the circumstances going uphill or wind or whatever causes me to try to change that. And so I have gear ratios that way. This summer I was out biking and I saw one of these folks riding uh, one of the old bicycles as a giant front wheel and a tiny back wheel, right? The reason why it's got a giant front wheel and a tiny back wheel, it doesn't have a chain at all. The pedals directly drive the front wheel of the bicycle, directly. Uh, and I saw that and I thought, wow, that's quite ridiculous until somebody thought to put a chain on there so you have a gear ratio so that the front tire can be smaller and you can you know, um, be effective at that. I saw one and then I saw another and then I saw five and it turns out they were having a stupid bike convention down here on the, on the trail and there were just dozens of them, giant silly bicycles uh, going along like that. Gear ratios, uh, an application of rotational kinematics, which is exactly analogous to translational kinematics.